All right, looks like uh, we're good to go to um, start off our Philadelphia area naval history portion of the schedule. Uh, so this first part of it is going to be presented by a selectee. So selectee, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody and it's all yours. Copy. Uh, good evening, genuine master chiefs, genuine senior chiefs, genuine chiefs, and fellow selects of the Big J CPO Heritage Academy. I am AWOC Select Bill Johan, and I'll be presenting on naval history and its ties to Philadelphia. I'm going to start with a six minute video that will lay the uh, foundation for my presentation. Actually, one second. If you need um, a little time to get it uh, reset up, I can. Well, uh, so now it. it's. Oh, give me one second. It's OK. I'm going to play uh, the independent seaport museum and the CPO exhibit as you get that sorted out in the, okay. in the back. And then that way we'll circle back to you. All right. Sounds good. All right, so um, everybody, uh, if we were on the, the Big J, um, one of the things that we normally do is the heritage run across the bridge into Philadelphia, and then we visit the Independent Seaport Museum, where uh, we would actually be able to uh, tour and then do some uh, community relation uh, efforts over there with the submarine Bakuna and the uh, cruiser Olympia. So one of the things that uh, we're going to show you is a brief uh, virtual tour of both those ships. And then we're going to show you a video that we have put together for the CPO exhibit, which is back on the USS uh, New Jersey. And then uh, we'll come back and then learn a little bit more about uh, the overall history um, that uh, the selectee here will be uh, presenting. So. I'm going to do this. Some of these uh, precursor, uh, some of these uh, audio on these videos are a little quiet because they were recording outside without um, you know, professional microphones. So I'm going to turn it up, but it still might be kind of hard to hear. So just uh, just warning there. Hello, everyone. We are here aboard Submarine Bakuna at Independent Seaport Museum. My name is Greg Williams. I am the ship manager and educator. Today we'll be talking a little bit about the ship's history as we kick off a video series that will take you on a virtual tour of the submarine. Bakuna is a Vallejo class submarine with a Guppy 1A modification. She is part of a group of submarines often referred to as fleet type submarines or fleet boats. And she is the last remaining example of a Guppy 1A modified submarine in line. Bakuna was laid down in April 1943 at Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut. Construction took nine months. She was launched in January of 1944 and commissioned in May that same year. She saw immediate service during World War II, operating in the Pacific Ocean against Imperial Japan. Bakuna conducted five war patrols, earned four combat stars for her service, and sank three and a half ships. Bakuna remained in the Pacific until 1949 when she was transferred back to the East Coast. During the Cold War, she served a range of missions from espionage to participating in NATO exercises, 
although the bulk of her career during that time period was as a training boat at the submarine school in New London, Connecticut. There, she taught the next generation of submariners how to go to sea until she was finally decommissioned in 1969 after 25 years of service. Hey everyone, we hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like, maybe share it, and then drop down to the comments and suggest further topics you'd like us to cover in these kinds of things in the future. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Hi and welcome, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm the curator of historic ships here at Independent Seaport Museum. Behind me, you can see the oldest steel warship afloat, the USS Olympia, at 125 years old this year. She served in the Spanish-American War and is one of the last remaining warships from that era. She is also the one of two remaining American warships that served in World War I. Today we're going to be talking about the general history of the ship and taking a brief tour on board. So the cruiser Olympia has a really unique and interesting history where she actually served the United States Navy from 1895 to 1922. So that means she was part of the Spanish-American War of 1898, and she was also in World War I from about 1915 to 1918. In the Spanish-American War, that's where she became most famous uh, under Admiral George Dewey at the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. At the Battle of Manila Bay, the United States first flexed its muscles with these new steel warships. We came into the fight, and we won it within six hours, and uh, essentially took control of the Philippines. This proved to the rest of the world, all the big empires of the day, in Europe and in England, that um, the United States was finally ready to become a world power. We started branching out into the rest of the world from there, and we officially became, as we know today, a superpower from the ship and from its efforts in the Philippines and the Spanish-American War. In 1900, the Olympia went through a major refit where she got modernized to modern specifications. This included a lot of new electrical upgrades, uh, upgrades to fire control, and preparing to add wireless radio aboard. From 1902 to 1905, after her modernization, she served under the Theodore Roosevelt administration doing diplomatic duties around the Caribbean. After 1905, she actually went to Annapolis to serve as the Naval Academy's flagship. And there she trained some of her earliest officers uh, on the operation of modern warships. A lot of these officers went on to serve in battleships and cruisers and destroyers in World War I and World War II. At the beginning of World War I, Olympia was modernized yet again. After 20 years of being a uh, protected cruiser, they decided that she needed to modernize and become a light cruiser, basically a vessel that could help support the battleship fleet if needed, and also provide uh, convoy escort duties and protection against submarines on the East Coast. Since she was so old, they figured that she would no longer be a combat vessel in the same way she was early on, and they uh, started using her for new missions. Her main missions at the end of the war, and in World War I, were mostly diplomatic. She floated around the Mediterranean the, uh, around England and actually up near Russia as well at the end of the or at the beginning of the Russian Revolution, and uh, by being a flagship at that time, she was an embassy. She was an embassy for the United States. From there, she uh, continued after the war, 1919 and 1920, to help with the flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, the flu had severely destroyed Europe and was continuing to do so well into 1919. So Olympia's medical staff actually were on hand in especially Venice, Italy, to support the Italians, to support people in the Mediterranean and help them get through the uh, effects of the war and the effects of this disease. Olympia's last mission was to bring home the unknown soldier of World War I. She did this in October of 1921 and arrived by November 9th, 1921 at Washington Naval Yard in DC. From there, the casket was removed from the ship and transferred to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which today is the most sacred site in the United States, guarded 24-7 by its own guard, and to this day, and every single day, guarded and treasured by the United States as a site of memorial and a remembrance.
concludes today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments for me or any questions, you can leave them in the comment section of the video. If you have any suggestions, if you want to see a special space on the ship, I'm more than happy to show you it. Um, we're going to try to get down below decks, places you haven't seen before. We're going to walk the decks as much as we can. And if you have any suggestions at all, please let us know. We are going to be following this. We're going to be following up with more and more videos. And um, we would love to hear your input. So have a good day and uh, stay safe and healthy. Battleship New Jersey CPO exhibit. I'm Senior Chief Jason Baldwin, and I'd like to welcome you today to our beloved CPO exhibit. The exhibit was commissioned in 2016. It was made for chiefs by chiefs. It took about eight months to develop what you're going to see today. Uh, amongst our uh, displays here at the uh, CPO exhibit are our notable, notable chief petty officers. Here we have Mass Chief Bashir, the first African American. Master Diver in the United States Navy. We also have Chief Petty Officer John Henry Turpin. Chief Turpin was the first African American Chief Petty Officer. We also have Chief Petty Officer Bob Feller. Bob Feller put his Major League Baseball career on hold to serve in combat during World War II as a gun captain. We have Chief Petty Officer Chris Lyle, that's the highest kill rate of any American sniper in history. We have Master Chief Anna Gervartania, who is the first female Master Chief Petty Officer. We have here Chief Petty Officer Linda Oldhorn Purdy, who is from the Crow Nation, one of the first Native American Chief Petty Officers. Of course, we have our youngest Chief Petty Officer, Diego Enrique Santiago. He was battling lung cancer terminally, and his biggest wish was to become a Chief Petty Officer. So he was pinned and sadly passed away in 2006. And we have Chief Petty Officer Loretta Perfectus Walsh, who was the first female Chief Petty Officer, native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She's buried nearby in St. Patrick's Cemetery in Holy Farm. Hi, welcome to the Battleship New Jersey. Again, we're in the CPO exhibit. I'm Master Chief Josh Mangum. Here we have our panel on Loretta Perfectus Walsh. So she was a Naval Reservist. She was the first woman to enlist in the Navy and was the first to enlist in a non-nurse occupation. On this panel, you'll see some younger photos of her. You'll see two local senior chief petty officers who are performing a reclaim memorial ceremony at the cemetery where she's buried in Oliphant, PA. You also will see her enlistment contract, and we actually have some of the first models for Navy female enlisted uniforms. Here we have the rating badge, the bosom make knot, and the service stripes, all from, from the same set from the same time period. Another aspect of the Big J CPO exhibit in the Division Chief's office, we have a young sailor who is uh, getting guidance from Chief Petty Officer, and also had the A Division, and inside the Division Chief's office, there is a portrait of ETC Michael Wayne Gorchinski. Chief Gorchinski was serving aboard the USS New Jersey in 1980. Chief Gorchinski was killed during the Barracks bombings on October 23rd, 1983. One of the things we, we do here on the Battleship New Jersey as part of the CPO Heritage Academy is every year the selectees perform a ceremony and a memorial to POWs, fallen soldiers, sailors, heroes, people who affected the Navy in a great way. Senior Chief Shannon Kent is pictured here. This mural was done by local artist Marcus Monteros. She is CTIC, who was posthumously promoted to Senior Chief Petty Officer in January 2019. She was killed in Mampage, Syria during a bombing. Her funeral was in DC. It was attended by over 3,000 Chief Petty Officers and officers in the Navy. Her impact was felt both at the deck plates by people she served with, and as well as she has impacted future generations. We're honored to have her in the Chief Petty Officer exhibit. In this part of the exhibit, we have the CPO cap devices from 1893 to the present. As we can see throughout history, the evolution of the Chief Petty Officer cap device has changed pretty dramatically. The original cap device for Chief Petty Officers was nothing more than a naval gilt button. We originally had some of the wire rope wound chains around the bow anchor, different variations of USN, all the way to our present senior chief anchors, both the mid shank and high shank, and a United States Navy Reserve uniform button. Right below the history of the cap devices is the CPO cutlass uh, portion of the exhibit. 
within there, we have a description of the cut list. And one of the interesting things here is you see the female CPO cut list was donated by senior chief HMCS Sherry Snaza, who was married to Greg Snaza, who's the CMC out of, out of Norfolk, and who we passed away a few years prior to our establishing the exhibit. You'll actually see a picture of the Snaza family, which we put in there. We wanted to honor Greg and Sherry, one for you know, their service, two in his memory, and three uh, because she was a part of uh, donating a lot of uniform items to our exhibit. So now you, you, you see HMCS Sherry Snaza's dinner dress, blue uh, CPO female uniform. Uh, this is actually her ribbon rack, her warfare devices, her cummerbund, top to bottom, this, this is her uniform. And she, of course she has a combination cover, which a lot of our female chief petty officers and female sailors who serve for more than five, 10 years, uh, had a lot of honor wearing that cover. And so we, we made sure we had that here in the exhibit as well. Amongst the uniforms we have displayed here in the chief petty officers exhibit, it's a pair of aviation winter greens from World War II. During World War II, due to the high volume of qualified personnel that were needed for the war effort, there were two types of chief petty officers. One was acting chief petty officers, and the other ones were permanent appointments. Aviation machinist mate John Carrot was actually a PBY flight engineer, and he was a temporary appointed chief due to his background in aviation prior to the war. Okay, welcome to the Wall of Honor within the Chief Petty Officer Exhibit Mess. So the Wall of Honor, it covers Chief Petty Officers who have been awarded the Medal of Honor since 1898 to present. There are the, the four Navy divers who rescued the sailors from the Squalus. There's Floyd Bennett, who was Floyd Bennett Field in New York, who's named after him. He performed the flight to the North Pole for the first time. So there are many ships named for Chief Petty Officers, the most famous obviously the USS Chief. There's also the USS Stepham, Paul, John Penn, James E. Williams, the Hill, the Truett, and of course the Gilbert Black. When we first designed the CPO exhibit here on the Battleship New Jersey, we wanted to go with the timeline of the Chief Petty Officer from the inception of the Chief Petty Officer rank, starting with 1893 with Navy Regulation Circular Number 1 through the early war periods encompassed the first time Chief Petty Officer went to war in 1898 during the Spanish-American War, through the interwar periods in 1913 through 1922, and again, the mid-20s up until World War II, and World War II to the present. Here in front of you now, we have the USS Wallace, as well as a tribute to our Navy divers. You'll see on the left, we have a representative helmet that Carl Bashir would have worn. We also have a detailed history there about the challenges, both professional, racial, and personal, that he faced throughout his life honor uh, to have him represented here in our exhibit. Center in the panel is the USS Squalus. You mentioned it during the Wall of Honor. As you'll get close-ups, you'll see that the dive bell that they actually have to go down in, two men at a time, to rescue upwards of 23 sailors from the submarine. They went up and down for over 20 hours, alternating between each other, and as a result, were awarded the Medal of Honor. And another special part of our exhibit here is uh, Master Diver Rebecca Jones. She's one of the first female Master Divers and graduated top of her class in dive school. So she sent us her dive boots, her coin, her flippers, her dive suit and goggles, and her dive knife, as well as a t-shirt from her mess and her retirement ceremony program. One of our displays here at the exhibit is our CPO charge book. Now the charge book is here on display and any Chief Petty Officer past present can sign the charge book while I'm visiting the exhibit. On the front of the vessel, we have here our CPO exhibit coin, which is made from teak from the decking of the Battleship New Jersey, along with our encampment coin and the inaugural exhibit coin. As we see inside the vessel, two frame numbers that are on the coin, one of which is the actual space that the exhibit is in, and the other is the actual chief's mess on the Battleship New Jersey. This concludes your tour of the Battleship New Jersey CPO exhibit. We hope that you learned something, that you got to see what the power of the mess coming together can do in a very short amount of time, and that you got in touch with some of our legacy, some of our heritage as it feeds our future. The exhibit was built by CPOs and Chief Selects uh, at a request of the Battleship's director. And those relationships that were built over time with the ship and with the local messes 
is what has established this event that you're a part of today. On average, we have around 300 active duty FPS and cell res chiefs uh, on board for this event every year and around 70 chief selects. And they all get to visit the ship, stay overnight and tour it and get to handle the actual artifacts in the exhibit as well as perform uh, battle stations and functions around the ship. So we hope you enjoyed the tour and we appreciate you being here and congrats on your selection of Chief Petty Officer. So as you all could see uh, in uh, Philadelphia and the Big J, uh, the CPO exhibit, uh, Master Chief uh, Josh Mangum uh, wrapped that uh, exhibit information up really nicely there at the end. I wanna post some information if you wanna help donate uh, into the chat room here. Uh, for the Independent Seaport Museum, those two museum ships over there, if you're ever in the area, please uh, you know, take time, stop by. They're great to see in person once uh, you know the travel restrictions and or the museums reopen. But uh, other than that, we're going to learn a little bit more about naval heritage uh, and history there in the Philadelphia area. Uh, Chief Select uh, Drummond, are you ready? Hope so. Let's try this again. All right, over to you. All right. All right, we're going to start with the video. Hi, I'm Chief Petty Officer Fabrizio, alongside USS Constitution, America's Ship of State, and the world's oldest commission warship afloat. We're going to go on a journey through the history of the United States Navy. It all started on October 13, 1775, when the Second Continental Congress voted to outfit two sailing vessels to intercept transports that were looking to reinforce the British Army in America. This initial legislation from which the Continental Navy grew is essentially the Navy's birth certificate. Although the Continental Navy disbanded shortly after the American Revolution due to a lack of funding, many Americans still recognize the need for a full-time Navy. On March 27, 1794, Congress passed the Naval Armament Act, which formally authorized the construction of six frigates. The Naval Act laid the foundation for America's first full-time Navy, which would see the nation through the Barbary War and the War of 1812. During the Civil War, the Navy continued to grow and evolve. The first battle between ironclad warships Monitor and Merrimack foreshadowed the future of naval warfare. The Navy also played a pivotal role in the Civil War, successfully blockading southern ports and supporting Army actions along waterways. These actions helped lead to the demise of the Confederacy, and by the end of the conflict, the Navy had expanded to more than 600 ships. Serving among those ships were almost 18,000 African-American sailors. Following the Civil War, the Navy began to heavily invest in new technologies, culminating in the development of the new Steel Navy and the introduction of the battleship in the 1880s. In 1898, the Navy defeated the aging Spanish fleet at the battles of Manila Bay and Santiago Bay, establishing itself as a world power during the Spanish-American War. In 1907, the United States debuted its modern fleet to the world with a circumnavigation of the globe, which came to be known as the voyage of the Great White Fleet. The nation, more specifically, President Theodore Roosevelt, used the Great White Fleet to demonstrate the modern U.S. Navy's might and to establish America's place as a world power. That power was tested on April 6, 1917, when the United States entered World War I. Although the war was primarily fought on land, the Navy played a major role transporting more than two million men to Europe to fight, an impressive logistical feat even for today. World War I also saw the birth of naval aviation and the introduction of women into the U.S. Navy. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, plunging America into World War II. 
Out of the ashes of its darkest hour, the Navy built and expanded its fleet into the largest and most modern in the world at the time. During the war, the Navy played a vital role in the Pacific theater, sailors supported an island hopping campaign and won several major naval battles, including Midway, the Philippine Sea, and Leyte Gulf. In the Atlantic, the Navy fought the German U-boat threat, transporting troops and equipment to Europe and supported major operations, including the D-Day landings at Normandy. America entered World War II with 790 ships, but by the end had grown to 6,768. During the same period, the Navy grew from 380,000 personnel to more than 3.4 million. Following World War II, the size of the U.S. Navy fluctuated significantly as it sought to counter the Soviet Union and other threats during the Cold War. For the next few decades, the Navy supported operations around the world, including a successful blockade during the Cuban Missile Crisis, patrols countering a Soviet nuclear threat, and actions off the coast of Korea, Vietnam, and in the Persian Gulf. Following the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the Navy entered a new era as it began fighting the global war on terrorism. The Navy supported special operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and conducted tactical strikes against terrorist threats around the globe. Today, the United States Navy has the most capable fleet in the world. The U.S. fleet includes more than 300,000 personnel on active duty and another 100,000 in the ready reserve. On, above, and below the sea, we have nearly 300 deployable ships and more than 3,500 aircraft. From the seafloor to space, from the blue water to the littorals, and in the information domain, America's Navy will continue to promote American prosperity, deter aggression, protect the nation, and when necessary, conduct prompt and sustained combat operations at sea and ashore to defeat any enemy. Since 1775, today's U.S. Navy sailors continue a proud heritage of maritime dominance. All right, we transition into the uh, presentation now. All right, can we see the presentation? Everything looks good. No, no question. I don't see anything. Okay, give me one second. All right, how about now? You're good. We got it. Good to go. All right, here we go. So, again, uh, Naval History and its ties to Philadelphia. I tried to get us caught up here. Chief Select uh, Drohan out of Knoxport Dix, New Jersey, also a Philadelphia native. So, here's the references I used for my uh, presentation. This is also uploaded into the uh, Fantail file as well. All right, so before the Continental Navy was established, Pennsylvania actually had its own Navy. Uh, and when the Revolutionary War broke out in 1775, the Pennsylvania Colonial Safety Committee and the Second Continental Congress realized that the colonial capital of Philadelphia would need to be protected from British vessels on the Delaware River. So on July 6, 1775, they authorized the purchase and outfitting of ships for that purpose. And by 13 October, 1775, there were 13 vessels in the Pennsylvania Naval Fleet. Thomas Reed of neighboring Delaware would be appointed Commodore of the Pennsylvania Navy 
and would later go on to become a Commodore in the later established Continental Navy as well. Uh, Reed also played an important part in uh, helping George Washington during the famed Delaware River crossing of the Revolutionary War. So Philadelphia is also known as, as the birthplace of the U.S. Navy. Um, the Continental Congress's resolution to procure armed vessels was adopted in Philadelphia on 13 October 1775, and this was a legislation out of which the Continental Navy was derived. Within a few days of that vote, Congress established a naval committee that would govern the operations, legislation, rules, and regulations of the newly formed Continental Navy. First four vessels of the newly formed Continental Navy were also built in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was also the first place Cong Congress would lease land to support the newly formed Continental Navy, and this was the beginnings of the Navy Yard, which we'll touch on in more detail later. All right, anybody know who this gentleman here is? Or have they ever been to this statue? I can't call on anybody, so somebody fire off if they know. If not, I'm going to move on. This is Commodore John Barry known as one of the fathers of the American Navy. So Commodore Barry was uh, one of the lesser known heroes of the American Revolution, whose accomplishments are often overshadowed by those of his commander, John Paul Jones, but he would go on to become known as the father of the American Navy. And these words are actually inscribed on a bronze tablet at the bottom of his statue. He was born in Ireland, but relocated to Philadelphia at the age of 15. As a young boy, Barry admired his uncle, who was a merchant ship captain, and the young Commodore Barry determined early on that he was destined for a life at sea. Big John, as he was known, was well regarded by the people of Philadelphia and respected as a reliable and expert merchant seaman with a personable nature. Uh, it's kind of telling another fact I found about how good of a sailor he was just prior to his start in the Continental Navy. Um, Barry set a record by traveling 237 miles by dead reckoning in a 24-hour period, which at the time was the fastest sailing day recorded in the 1700s. Um, Barry had a spectacular career in the Continental Navy and was widely regarded as a hero of the American Revolution for his victories against the British in the Revolution and for his unwavering support of his new country. He actually received his first captain's commission in the Continental Navy from John Hancock in 1776 and would eventually go on to become the first commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy after receiving commission number one from President George Washington on 22 February 1797. However, this commission was actually backdated to 4 June 1794, which was the day he was selected by Congress as senior captain of the Federal Navy. So the title Commodore didn't exist in the Federal Navy at the time, but Barry would hold the courtesy title of Commodore until his retirement in 1801, and would actually remain the head of the U.S. Navy until his death in September of 1803. Uh, Commodore Barry has had a total of four U.S. Navy ships named in his honor, the most recent being the currently active USS Barry VDG-52, home ported in Yokosuka, Japan. All right, so in addition to the Navy, uh, Philadelphia is known as the birthplace of the country, and this is where the Constitution was written and signed. So in addition to being the birthplace of the Navy, the Founding Fathers met in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention at the Pennsylvania State House, which is now known as Independence Hall. This is also where the statue of Commodore Barry happens to reside. And that was the slide we saw earlier. The statue is actually on the south side of Independence Hall. Although the Constitution was signed at the conclusion of the convention on September 17, 1787, it did not actually become the official framework of our government until it was ratified on 21 June 1788. So something else I learned about the Constitution and the Navy, the Navy is the only branch of service identified where Congress has a responsibility or had a responsibility, not the authority to provide and maintain a Navy. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 13 states that Congress is to provide and maintain a Navy. So uh, another milestone occurred in Philadelphia was the Naval Armament Act, also known as the Naval Act of 1794 and was adopted on 27 March 1794 and authorized the purchase of the original six frigates of the newly formed standing Navy at a cost of $688,888. The reason for the Naval Armament Act was that Congress recognized the need for a standing Navy after U.S. merchant shipping was being harassed and captured at will with no recourse by pirates. 
Additionally, Congress had to meet their responsibility to provide and maintain a Navy in accordance with the Constitution. Design of these ships was charged to another gentleman who was also known as one of the fathers of our Navy, Joshua Humphreys, who was a resident of nearby Haverford, PA, a suburb located just outside of Philadelphia. Humphreys was lauded as a shipbuilder and at the time was recognized as the nation's foremost naval architect. All right, so now we're going to move on into the Navy Yard. This is actually a shot of the Navy Yard from 1955. So uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard and its history, um, dating back to the founding of our country in 1776, actually, Continental Congress leased land along Philadelphia's Front Street docks to support naval defense. And the first six frigates authorized under the Naval Act were built in the same area that would eventually be known as South Park Yard. Naval operations continued at South Park Yard until the Navy's need had outgrown the area and the city of Philadelphia sold the 923-acre League Island area to the government for the whopping sum of $1 in 1868 and the Navy would shift operations there in 1871. League Island would eventually become the Navy Yard and would play an important role in shipbuilding and repair for the Navy. It reached its peak during World War II when it built 53 ships and repaired another 574. Interestingly enough, the USS New Jersey and its sister ship, the USS Wisconsin, were built there. And the last ship built at the Navy Yard was the USS Blue Ridge LTC-19 in 1967. The Navy Yard would actually continue the operations as an installation until its closure in 1996. So we saw this in yesterday's video. Um, this is the Big J being launched exactly one year later uh, after Pearl Harbor attacks. Here's an infographic uh, just about the naval history of Pennsylvania. There's over, um, there's been over 30 ships named after Pennsylvania it's cities, places, and people. And additionally, Benjamin Franklin actually served as a naval representative to Europe, uh, supporting John Paul Jones during raids and helping to bring the war to the British shores. Actually, Franklin's visionary sea policy would build a strong foundation for our Navy as well. Uh, so, uh, Loretta Perfectus Walsh, which we just learned about, um, she was really a pioneer and a trendsetter, set a lot of firsts. So originally from Philadelphia, PA, she held many firsts in the Navy. She was um, the first woman to enlist in a Naval Reserve on March 17, 1917. Also the first woman promoted to Chief Petty Officer and was the first woman to serve in a non-nursing capacity in any branch of the military. And sadly, uh, as was mentioned, she passed away from tuberculosis at the young age of 29 in Oliphant, PA. So, uh, we got the history of the country, the history of the Navy, but some might not know this, but the history uh, of the Marine Corps, the, the birthplace of the Marines is actually Philadelphia, a spot called Tun Tavern. This is a, a sketch of Tun Tavern uh, from years ago. And then there's the sign here, which acknowledges uh, this is this place where Tun Tavern stood and is recognized as the birthplace of the Marine Corps. Uh, the gentleman to the far right is Samuel Nichols, uh, Nicholas, and he would actually go on to be the first Commandant of the Marines. Touch a little bit more on that here in a second. So Tun Tavern, uh, built by Samuel Carpenter in Philadelphia in 1865. Um, it is officially known, recognized as the birthplace of the United States Marine Corps. It was a popular meeting place for many notable groups back then, such as uh, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and President George Washington. On 10 November 1775, the Second Continental Congress would charge Philadelphia and Samuel Nicholas with fielding two Marine battalions. Nicholas would appoint the proprietor at the time, Robert Mullen, as chief Marine recruiter, and Mullen would lure recruits to Tun Tavern with cold beer in the excitement of serving in the newly formed Marines. Nicholas would go on to become the first commissioned officer in the U.S. Continental Marines and also is also recognized as the first commandant of the Marine Corps. So, and just wrapping it up here, it just kind of shows where we've grown from, uh, from our humble beginnings of the Continental Navy. In 1775, we had a total of 620 personnel. And then as was mentioned in the video, uh, at our peak at World War II, we had over 6,700 ships and over 3.4 million personnel. 
added some numbers here about how we ended uh, FY20. We had over 280 ships and just about 346,000 uh, active duty and just under 59,000 reserve force strength numbers for the Navy. So we were tiny, huge, and then we kind of come back down some, but we're staying strong. Uh, so that's it. That concludes my brief. Uh, uh, any pearls of wisdom from the genuine chiefs, senior chiefs, or master chiefs out there you care to share with us or any questions or feedback from me? Hey, Select, thank you. Thank you for the training you provided us. Uh, okay. At this juncture, um, due to time constraints, we're going to move over to uh, Chief uh, Michelle. Uh, you wanted to do a quick brief uh, before I let the charge book training our chargebook team does a, their quick brief and we transition over to the chargebook committee.